And uh, I suppose our theme this morning has been the love of God. And uh, if there's one thing that Satan hates, it's the love of God. He hates you, he hates me, and he hates the church. And we're going to look over the next uh, few weeks, at least when I'm speaking, on the subject of spiritual warfare. What is that? Well, at its essence, it's a conflict between good and evil. It's a conflict between those who are in the kingdom of God and those who are in the kingdom of Satan. Now, which kingdom are you in this morning? It's the most vital question that you could ask yourself. Have you been translated, have you been transported from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you? Praise God. If you haven't, you're in serious trouble. I want to say that this morning. And my prayer is that God this morning will transfer you from one kingdom into another. Now, over the years, I have attended meetings, bizarre meetings, about spiritual warfare, when I've seen people shouting at the devil, rebuking the devil, binding and loosing without any understanding of what those terms mean at all. If you had talked of binding and loosing to the Jews, they would have known exactly what you meant. And I want to tell you, it has nothing to do with the devil. And we'll come on to that in future weeks. I've seen some bizarre things. I've been into some bizarre meetings that have made me feel quite unwell and uh, concerned. Peter says this, Be sober-minded and watchful, for your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Can you imagine the destruction of a lion on the human body? And yet this is the imagery that Peter is giving to us Christians, warning them of the destruction that can be caused by Satan in the lives of those who are following Christ. Now sometimes it's hard to comprehend a threat that comes from things that aren't seen. But we're warned in the scriptures that the warfare is very real and we must arm ourselves with what God has given us just as a good father protects his children, so our father protects those who love him. And interesting that God intends, it seems, that part of our sanctification should be to enter this fight. And uh, you remember what Paul said to Timothy, chapter 1, verse 18, this charge I commit to you, uh, Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. Well, how about that? It seems that the warfare is quite good for those who are following Christ, in that he builds their faith. Again, in the same book, Paul says, fight the good fight of faith, because this good fight refines our faith as gold. Again, the same thought in Peter 1, verses 6 and 7, this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now let me repeat that not only is Satan absolutely intent on destroying you and your family and this church. Indeed, every church where Christ is lifted up and seen as the only hope he utterly despises and hates. Now, what's the origin of all this? What's the origin of evil? Where does it come from? 
Well, we know this, that in the beginning, God created what? The heavens and the earth. He created the heavenly realm. He created angels. He created principalities. And one of those angels was Lucifer. We're going right back to basics, aren't we? It's good to go back to basics. Actually, if you go into the art gallery in Birmingham, you can see a statue of Lucifer. It's hideous. But right at the very beginning, as it were, God created an angel called Lucifer. And we have some clues in the Old Testament what Lucifer was like originally, and you can find that in Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 12 to 17. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. You were the sealer of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the ruby, topaz and emerald, the chrysolite, onyx and jasper, the sapphire, turquoise and beryl. Your settings and mounts were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. I placed you there with an anointed guardian cherub. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked about amidst fiery stones. You were blameless in your behavior from the day you were created and si until sin was discovered in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I defiled you and banished you from the mountain of God. The guardian cherub expelled you from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom on account of your splendor. I threw you down to the ground. I placed you before kings that they might see you. So this beautiful, wonderful angel called Lucifer, Lucifer was put in a position of great authority. And he was perfect, a special place at the center of God's throne. <clears throat> and he was created a free moral agent, just as you are. And he, uh, he didn't have to choose evil, but he did. And uh, you'll find again in Isaiah chapter 14, another reference to him, verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven. O shining one, son of the morning, you have been cut down to the earth, you who have made the nations weak. You said in your heart, I will go up to heaven, I will raise my throne above the stars of God, I will sit on the mount of meeting in the far north, I will go much higher than the clouds, I will make myself like the Most High. Isn't it incredible that a created being should talk to his creator in that way? Almost unbelievable. And yet men and women do it every day who don't know Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but you will be brought down to the place of the dead, to the bottom of the day. He's called the sun of the morning. That literally means day star. And what did he attempt to do? Well, Ascend to heaven, raise his throne above the throne of God, ascend above the heights of the clouds and make himself like the most high God. And we know from the book of Revelation that what Lucifer did was he took a third of the angels and was cast out of heaven. And if we were to continue reading in Ezekiel, we will see that God did this. Chapter 28, God removed his beauty. He disgraced him, making a spectacle of him, expelling him from heaven. He removed his power, cast him from the heaven to the earth and brought him down to the pit. Now, how was this all possible? How is it all possible that in this perfect place which he occupied, that sin could enter in. 
And of course, the Bible gives us no answer to that, but it seems to me the answer is obvious. You see, an eternal God who is without sin, who is perfect in every way, he always existed and always will, had no beginning, and uh, is absolutely perfect, cannot create something greater than himself, obviously. Um, God cannot choose evil. And he, what he makes is lesser by definition than himself. And if men and women are to be tested, and if Lucifer was to be tested, there had to be that ability to turn away from the Maker. You see, the creation can never be equal to the Creator, although some people worship the creation. They're called pantheists. They worship the creation as if the creation is equal with God. Well, no, it isn't. And uh, it can never be equal. Now, of course, God made us in His image. He gave us minds and wills similar to His own. But if He is going to create men and women in His likeness, there has to be that ability to choose the wrong thing. Otherwise, we would simply be robots, automatons. Who wants a child that's a robot that simply does what I tell it to do? Do you want a child like that? And uh, freedom of choice untested is just a theory and not a reality. And uh, Lucifer and his angels chose to sin. And the consequences are awful. And we live with them today. Those who didn't sin were called holy angels or elect angels. Now, who deceives Satan? I mean, we know Adam and Eve were deceived by Satan, but who deceived him? And the Bible, again, is clear. Nobody did. And Jesus affirms this. He says that Satan is the father of lies. He lied both to the angels and to humanity because he was already a liar. Are you following me? I hope I'm expressing myself properly. Furthermore, Jesus said he was a murderer from the beginning. You'll read about that in John's Gospel. Jesus is speaking to a group of Jews in John 8, and he says this, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore you do not hear, because you are not of God. Lies and murder have their origin in Satan. And by deceiving mankind in the garden, effectively every man and woman was murdered. And one day without Christ would suffer eternal separation from God. Now the Bible's clear that we've got to know what the devil's strategies are. Well, we've heard already that he's a liar. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. You do know that, God, that the devil speaks only three times in the Bible, do you? Only three times. I once preached on this many years ago, and a young fellow came to me and said, you're wrong. He spoke four times, 
but he didn't. He spoke only three times. In the Garden of Eden, he said to Adam and Eve, God is not good. He's keeping something from you. He's not telling the truth. You won't die. He's still telling people that lie today. Shirley is filled with people who are convinced by the devil that one day they will not be eternally separated from God. And has God really said this to you? He questioned God. He questioned the Word of God. And you remember what happened in the book of Job? I love that story. It's as if, oh, it's a strange story to love, but there is Satan, as it were, queuing up because he's, he doesn't have a free hand. He has a long leash, a long lead, but he doesn't have a free hand. He's only allowed to do what God allows him to do. And now what does he do? He comes and he says, man is no good. This man, Job, just loves you because you're what you've given him. See, he's now trying another tactic. God's no good, man's no good. And you know the story of how God permitted him to bring awful things on Job. But God put it right in the end, didn't he? And um, he's, a, he's a liar. What's the third time? He come, you now he's got a problem. Because he comes to the man who is not only God, but man. Now oh, he's stuck now. He's stuck now. He's tried, he's tried defaming man to God. He's tried defaming, defaming God to man. Now he's coming to the God-man. And he's never going to succeed. If you're the Son of God, if you're the Son of God, if you're the Son of God, do this, do this, but don't go to the cross. That was Satan's silent plea. He blinds the minds of unbelievers. If you've got those you love who aren't yet the Lord's and we continue to pray for them, Satan has blinded their eyes so they can't see the light of the gospel. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. Mm. See, he not only speaks lies, he hides what's true what he does. Very clever. He keeps men and women from seeing the treasures of the love of God, which we've been singing about this morning. He masquerades as an angel of light, 2 Corinthians 11, 13. For such are false apostles. You know there are false apostles false teachers, false preachers, switch on the television and go to the God channel and various other spurious channels, you'll find plenty of them. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers. His end will be according to their works. Satan has servants in the church. They just profess enough truth to persuade people that they're genuine. I, I liken this to a nice ham sandwich. You know, you do a nice ham sandwich, you put ham on you put some salad on it, put some tomatoes on it, but just a little pinch of arsenic, just a pinch of poison that you can barely see. And what does God say about this? He says such people are preaching the doctrines of demons. Jesus described them, describes them as being like wolves in sheep's 
clothing, leading people to destruction. Satan tempts people to sin. He couldn't succeed, of course, with Jesus in the wilderness, but he did it successfully with Judas, you remember, just before he died. And in 2 Corinthians, Paul is concerned, chapter 11, verse 3, he's concerned about the believers. He says, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. He plucks the word of God out of men's hearts and chokes the faith, their faith. You know the story in Mark, the parable of the soil, four types of soil. The seed of the word is sown, some falls on the pathway, and the birds take it away. And Jesus explains this to us. He says, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word which was sown in them. He snatches away the word. He hates it. If you've trusted Christ, John says I keep dropping out. That's probably not a bad thing. Um, He hates you, you know, hates your family, hates the church of Jesus Christ. What a pernicious person he is. How awful he is. And when you look around the world today and you see what's happening, just put the news on. The origin of it is Lucifer, Satan. Paul expresses his concern for the faith of the Thessalonians, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter has tempted you and our labor would be in vain. Satan causes some sicknesses. Do you remember Jesus healed a woman once and uh, when some criticized him for doing it on the Sabbath, Jesus said, ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, Peter describes Jesus who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. And let me say this again. God is sovereign, not Satan. Satan can only do what God permits him to do. He is not a free agent. But let's not make the mistake of saying that every sickness is caused by the devil. Lots of people have been devastated by preachers that have said such absurdities and have been left in a terrible state. Some are for our sanctification. Paul, he had a thorn in the flesh. That was for his sanctification. That was for his building up. And you remember the man born blind. You remember the man, John, I'm sure, uh, George, I'm sure you're ahead of me here, brother. Right? The man who was born blind and his disciples said, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sinned. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Satan accuses believers before God. He's constantly, I think we we sang about it this morning, about him ever living to make intercession for us. He's accusing you day and night, according to the book of Revelation. 
chapter 12, verse 10, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. He accuses you day and night, but we have a one who intercedes for us. We have an advocate, don't we? Praise God, I need an advocate. I'm, I'm going to just finish with this. Satan is, as I've said, very interested in destroying SCC. He's already made some attempts. Because, as I've said, the great cosmic battle is between the forces of God and the forces of Satan. And we Christians have changed sides, <laughs> haven't we? We've come to that point in our lives when we say, no more, no more. The Holy Spirit has come to me and has shown me I am utterly vile and horrible and my heart is as black as could be and I need a new one. You come to that point. That's the conviction of sin. And you, in response to that, if you are a Christian, repented of your sin, discovered that there was nothing lovely about you at all, though everyone's telling us self-esteem is the answer. That's the very antithesis of what God has to say about us. We are the enemies of Christ without him, and he comes and he gives us a new heart, a new life, a new disposition. Oh, we're precious in his sight. We are precious. But without Christ, you know, I hear people say, preachers say, well, he just can't wait. You're so lovely, you're so wonderful. No. So awful. Enemies of Christ, enemies of God, without hope. And the great love of God is that he came to us while we were yet sinners. Ugly. And he made us like Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? It's a great gospel, isn't it? And uh, we've changed sides. And when we gather as a church, we are a real threat to him. After all, look what's happening this morning. We're talking about the love of God. We've sung about the love of God. We've sung about his, 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 his mercy. We've sung about his, his love for us. Oh, he hates this. Satan hates this. And he'll do all he can. And sometimes we, we talk about Satan being utterly defeated, which he is. And one day we shall see this. And, uh, but here's the great danger. We must be aware of the enemy's schemes. You see, when the saints call to live in love, spend their time criticizing and accusing one another, Satan has come to the church. I'm not pulling any punches this morning. I believe it has to be said. When there are accusations, when there are uh, when there's was moaning and groaning and accusations about this and that and so on, Satan has come to the church because he wants to divide. That's what he does. When the flock turn on the shepherd... Satan has come to the church. Now, we're called upon to love one another. That doesn't always mean we agree with one another. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about your family, but we are a family. 
And families don't always agree, do they? But agreeing or rather disagreeing with someone is no reason not to love them and to have respect for them and to listen to them. Praise God. That's what love is about. Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't come criticising. It doesn't come turning on the shepherds. It doesn't come like that. There are proper ways of dealing with issues in the church. Proper ways of dealing with them. And maybe we'll come to that, although we've dealt with that on another occasion. We must treat each other with respect and affection. We are here to build, not to demolish. We're looking at the book of Nehemiah, which is about building. We're not, we're not demolishers. That is not the mind of Christ. We're builders, one brick upon another. And you know, one of the great tools of Satan is discouragement. Have you ever been discouraged? Someone once said to me, how often do you feel like giving up? I said, every week. I was being honest. You've been discouraged, haven't you? Who hasn't? People, they come to me, they say, oh, I'm discouraged. Well, join the queue. I'm discouraged. And this is one of the tools of Satan. And, you know, sometimes we quote this verse to people who don't attend church. It's in Hebrews 10, verse 25. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But we leave it there. But actually listen to the whole verse. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. I have a responsibility to you to attend a meeting to encourage you. And you have that responsibility to me. We have that responsibility to each other. It's not just attending a meeting, it's for encouragement. It's to come again the, against the discouragements of Satan. You know, word of criticism here and there, we've had a bad day, something went wrong, and suddenly we find ourselves discouraged and wondering if we can go on. And many, many, many men and women in the Bible found themselves in that position. I suppose the clearest example is Elijah, you remember? He'd had his victory over the prophets of Baal and Jezebel was after him. And uh, it says this, he came to a broom tree, sat under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestor. All great men and women of God have been there before that we are to build. Let me finish with a, an old, I might describe it as a fable, a, an old s story, but it's true. Not true, rather, but it's, it's true in what it says. The devil was advertising his tools for sale. I'm not sure he was using eBay or, or whatever, but... He was advertising his tools for sale. He was putting them up for sale. And they were all laid out for public inspection. They all had prices on them. And there was hatred and envy and jealousy and deceit and pride and lying and so on. All had their prices on them. But something was, one tool was apart from the rest. It was a harmless looking tool, worn more than any other. But it was priced very high. What's the name of this tool? Has one of the customers. The devil replied, it's discouragement. Why have you pr priced it so high? Because discouragement is more useful to me than any other. I can pry open and get inside a man's heart with that when I cannot get near him with any other tools. 
It's badly worn because I use it on almost everyone since so few people know it belongs to me. You've been discouraged? Join the queue. Realise that it's coming from Satan. Realise that's where its roots are. And let's forsake not the assembling of ourselves together so that we might encourage one another and stand together against this evil, pernicious foe of ours. Thank God Jesus has dragged him into the open, made an open show of him and dealt with him. And he only has power over us if we allow him to have power over us. And God, by his Holy Spirit, has given us all his tools in order to overcome him. And we shall look at these in the days that lie ahead. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for rescuing us for transporting us, translating us from this dark kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of your dear Son. And Lord, we want to be able to recognize what's happening in our lives and in the life of the church. Lord, we, we know that Satan tempts us to sin. There are times when we fail, but we thank you for the love of God. We thank you that your mercy is from everlasting to everlasting upon those who fear you. Lord, we thank you that we have an advocate with the Father we thank you, Lord, that you plead our cause and are always successful, whatever the accuser might say. Lord, please allow us to live as you planned, Lord. I pray that we might love one another with a pure heart fervently, Lord, according to your word. That we won't be those who are critical, Lord. We won't be those who fall into the very trap that Satan has brought to churches over many years. Sometimes we've fallen into the trap, Lord, and we ask your forgiveness. But Lord, build your church you will do that. And the gates of hell and all the wiles and the strategies of Satan will not succeed. Keep us, Lord, in your love. And when we disagree, Lord, we pray that we might still one, love one another and respect one another and encourage one another, Lord. So we bring ourselves to you this morning and thank you for all you have done and all you are planning to do. I thank you again, Lord, for the young people. I thank you for the children. I thank you for, for them taking part this morning. And repeat the prayer that we've had, Lord, that you will keep them and bring them, Lord, to a place of new birth, baptism, Cause this generation, Lord, to be a great power for you, Lord, by your Holy Spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.